ladies and gentlemen, we are. What I'm going to do today is to share with you uh, a few things that are really important for us to know when we try to apply, when we try to use technology in uh, our teaching. If you look at my title, I think you will notice that teaching is big font, technology is smaller. I think I'm doing that on purpose because at the end of the day, technology is a tool that a teacher will need to make use of skillfully, efficiently, and effectively uh, in the classroom. So that is something that we all need to remember. Technology is important. Technology is going to stay with us for many years to come, but technology is something that will have to serve us, the teachers. It's not the other way around, yeah? That's why the uh, presentation today is more about teaching and how we can uh, further improve on our teaching by using technology that is widely uh, available today. The most important takeaway is this. I always do this in my presentation. One point or two points that are important for us to remember is this. Point number one, the best way to get our students to learn more is to enhance the quality of our teaching. That is the most important thing, yeah? The best way to help our students to learn more with us in the classroom and outside the classroom is for us to improve the quality of our teaching. And point number two, we can do this with the help of technology. Let me say that again carefully. We can do this with the help of technology. But my presentation today actually is useful for you whether you teach with technology, with or without technology. Yeah, the most important thing continues to be us and what we do in the classroom and to what extent technology can be utilized efficiently in our teaching. My agenda today, I have five points that I want to share with you. The first one, very, very basic, very, very important, technology and the teacher, us, the user, the utilizer, the person who is using technology. Number two, the link relationship between technology and teaching methodology. So that's the second point that is very important. The teacher, when you walk into the classroom, you will be teaching, right? And the uh, approaches, the uh, teaching method that you use can be further enriched and enhanced using technology. The next point that is very important when we think about technology is how is it related to the choice of texts, the choice of materials, teaching materials that we're using in the classroom. I hope that makes sense, yeah? And the next thing, the next two things relate to the task, the activities, the things that you do with the students uh, as a follow-up to the uh, reading passages or listening or video materials that you've been using with your students. And finally, technology and assessment. Yeah. So remember, remember technology is there, but I think we need to continue to remember that it is the teacher that can make a big difference in terms of how we teach, in terms of how we can support our students' learning and technology can indeed play a role in the process. Let's look at the first one. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please stay awake because I'm going to keep asking you questions so that we can think together with me throughout my presentation. The first one is technology and the teacher. Yeah. One big question that we need to ask because for the past two or three years we've been using technology, is this question, are we tech savvy? I'm not thinking about teachers who can create, you know, new programs, new applications, but teachers who know enough about educational tools that can be useful for your teaching. Tools, simple tools like PowerPoint slides, for example, are you good at presenting information using PowerPoints, for example? 
what happens if you want to send PowerPoints to your students before they come to class? What happens if you want to turn your PowerPoint materials into e-learning materials? Very simple things like that. Are you skillful? Are you very familiar with how you can use tech tools in the classroom? Well, some of you may be asking, how many tech tools do we need? I think that is a question for Pak uh, Gumarang Dati and Finita Devi to respond to. If you ask me, five is more than enough. Five, no more than that. If you know more, that's okay. But five is like basic, basic technological tools that you may need to use for teaching, whether it's on-site, blended, or you know, online learning. Yeah. So it's a matter of knowing a small number of tech tools that are useful for your teaching and to what extent you can use this skillfully and efficiently. And number three, whether and to what extent you can use these tech tools for assessment uh, purposes. Later, I'll talk a bit more about assessment. So te technology can be used for teaching, can help your students to be more engaged, more can make your lesson more interactive, for example, but you can also be integrated in your lesson so that you can uh, enjoy uh, gaining information from your students in terms of whether and to what extent they have learned what they're supposed to be learning. So question number one is, are you tech savvy? Number two, you can't just use technology in the classroom. You should also be using technology as you know as 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 something that you do on a regular basis outside the classroom yeah do you have social media for example are you responsible and critical users of information that is nowadays widely freely available when you post messages on your social media are you spreading false information, for example? Are you spreading rumors? Or are you sending messages to people about good things that we all should appreciate? Things like uh, love, things like collaboration, things like kindness, things like respecting differences. Uh, that we see every day uh, in our life, whether you are spreading hatred, intolerance, and things like that. That, to me, is very, very important. Even simple things like your name in social media. But David, are you using your real name in social media? Or are you using names like Naughty Boy from Jember or something like that? I mean, that tells you because, because when you use social media, you are also projecting your identity as a responsible citizen and also as a professional teacher. So be very careful what you say and what you read from the internet. Are you using uh, the internet or social media for professional purposes? And that is very important because these days, Students are very familiar with things like weblog. Weblog is blog. Yeah, blogs have their own ways of conventions. Uh, blogs have certain things that you can say and certain things that you cannot say. And, and these are things that is part of your, uh, you know, learning, if you like. Uh, do you know how to create uh, YouTube videos, for example? Do you know how to edit uh, YouTube videos for good purposes? Yeah. So digital users is an important part of your life as, as a person and also as a teacher. But more importantly, you want to show your students that you are an active user, you are a responsible user, and you are a critical user of the uh, digital technology. And the last bit is about this. And these days, we can get a lot of information, we can learn a lot, by becoming a digital learner because information is not available. You don't have to go to school, actually. You don't have to go to universities. You don't have to attend workshops, but you can do things on your own. 
Yeah, you can further develop your multimodal skills, your transmedia literacy skills, and many other skills. You simply have to learn how to do it because the world is moving in that direction. Yeah, in terms of professional development, uh, you can make use of the internet, the information that is available on websites to further develop your professionalism. I remember about two years ago, there was the time when pandemic first came to the world and uh, people are grappling. People are were, were very, not very sure about how to use technology, including me. But then a group of people, uh, you know, colleagues from a university asked me to give a workshop on how to use technology in language learning or in teaching or in education. My first reaction was, no, I'm not good. I wasn't good. I did not know much about technology. So I asked Umang Jati if he could help. He said, sorry, but really, I'm so busy. There's so many requests for workshops and things like that. So what did I do? I decided to learn. I decided to self-learn how to use a number of tech tools. Because today, it's very, very easy. You just need to go to YouTube. Almost anything that you ever want to learn is available on YouTube. So I did spend like 10 hours or maybe 15 hours to prepare for my workshop on how to use technology uh, in education. Just an example, yeah? So that's the uh, technology part, technology and the teacher. The other part that is no less important is technology and teacher quality. At the end of the day, it's not the technology, but it's you as a teacher. Do you possess the quality of a good teacher? I have some examples here, and I would invite you to respond to questions like this. Are you a likable teacher? Can you give yourself a score from one to 10? One means you are not likable. Students, <laughs> students don't want to be taught by you. Or 10 means you are a very likable teacher. You may be surprised why likable, because likability apparently is an extremely important aspect or characteristic of a good teacher. Reason, very simple. We learn from other people that we like. It's, it's as simple as that. We make friends with people that we like, right? And we, there are many other examples. We, we, you know, we, we live together with our spouses because we like them. So likability is so important because teaching is about relationship, yeah? you're never alone. The other people there, the students, and that's the first thing that the students will, like, will, will find you, whether you are a likable person, a likable teacher, or not a likable teacher. So please respond in the, uh, in the chat box. Number two, are you a passionate teacher? From one to 10. Yeah, there are many teachers who are very passionate about teaching and there are also many teachers who are not very passionate about teaching for them it's just a job it's my job i teach i get paid i'm happy my students are not happy that's their problem not my problem yeah so being passionate is extremely important and the students can tell immediately whether you're a passionate teacher or not again from one to ten please give yourself a score I think for Gumawang Jati you don't need to respond because I know the answer is all 10 10 10 10 and 10. Number three, are you a motivating teacher? Are you able to teach in such a way that the students will say something like, teacher, teacher, I want more. I want to learn more from you. Please tell me more. So being able to motivate students is an extremely important quality of a teacher. More. This one, is another important consideration. Are you pedagogically competent? Do you have a number of approaches that you can use depending on the profile of your students and depending on their needs? I think this is the kind of things that initially you learn in school when you are, when you are doing your pre-service training, but this is something that you will further develop from experience and more importantly, from observing 
your colleagues who are excellent teachers. Yeah, that's how you do it. You can observe, you can consult colleagues whom you think are the best teacher in your school or in your university. So pedagogically competent. Number two, if you are an English language teacher, this is another important consideration. Are you linguistically competent? What is your level of proficiency? What is your knowledge about the uh, structure of the language, about text, about discourse, about culturally uh, relevant uh, information related to language learning? Yeah, linguistically competent. And finally, whether and to what extent you are technologically competent. As I said early on, you need to know something about technology and you need to know how to use it well for teaching purposes. So that is tech, technology and teacher quality. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense to you. Remember, the key thing to remember is the teacher is number one. The teacher is the most important thing in the classroom. The teacher is the, teacher is the person who can make learning possible and optimal in the classroom. Okay, so I'm moving on to number two, yeah? So the first part is the teacher. The second part is the way you teach, teaching methods or teaching approaches. I'm going to show you two pictures and I want you to respond to this as quickly as possible. Uh, which of the two images, in your opinion, is more student-oriented, is more student-friendly? This one or this one? Number one and number two. Ibu Areta, please say it out loud. Ibu Areta, please say number two. Yes, the answer is very straightforward, yeah, because there's, there's a very strong contrast between number one and number two. In number one, it's one teacher talking, one way street. In number two, I think, I think there is a lot of interaction that is happening. The teacher is not standing in front of the class. The teacher is actually mingling with the students in the middle of the classroom. And the students are looking at the picture, at the uh, images on the screen. And the students are more likely to have a lot more interaction and discussion in the classroom. Yeah. So teaching and teaching methods. It's your choice whether you want to be teaching like the lady on the left hand side or the teacher on the right hand side. It's your choice, but if you ask me, I would go for the second one. Baba Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, I think you're familiar. You will be you will agree with me that there are different approaches, different ways of teaching uh, in the classroom. For some reason, for some reason, the most popular, the most preferred way of teaching is the uh, lecturing style. I think teachers tend to avoid the uh, seminar style, inquiry style of teaching, uh, where the students are allowed to do a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, a lot of exchange of ideas. Uh, flip classroom, you may have heard about this. That is an excellent, excellent way of increasing the quality of learning in the classroom. Uh, CL stands for cooperative learning or group work situation, yep. If your teaching style is that of lecturing style, then I think we need to begin to consider other approaches or other methods of teaching, yep. The key word to remember is number one, variety. You need to try out different ways of different approaches to teaching and then Find one or two that your students enjoy the most. Find one or two that you can help your students to learn a lot more in your classroom. Whatever it is, whatever approach, whatever methods you are using, please remember your job as a teacher, your job as a language teacher in particular, is not to spend one whole hour talking, explaining things in the classroom. I think we should reduce the amount of talk. Yeah, if you don't reduce the amount of talk, then you are depriving your students of the opportunity to learn with you, with their peers, 
and with the help of technology. Yeah, teach less. That means 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, and the rest of the time should be given to the students to explore, you know, ideas to, 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 to find out for themselves uh, what needs to be learned from the internet, for example. Yeah, that is one way of uh, making the students or helping the students to learn more. So if you ask me this question, is kuliah trauma okay or not okay? My answer is yes, it is okay. But I think all of you remember this. Yeah, I'm sure all of you know this. Tell me and I'll forget. If you lecture, the students listen, they understand, and then they forget. Show me and I may remember. Demonstrate. Involve me and I'll understand and I'll learn more. So the, the, uh, the key thing to remember is to what extent you can involve your students, you can invite your students to participate in the learning game together with you and with the help of the, student, the other students and also with the support of technology, mm -hmm. yeah? Now, even when you use the lecturing style, I think you use it sparingly, number, number two, try to avoid monologic lecturing style instead use the more dialogic style of teaching uh, after my presentation i think gumamang jati will be presenting observe the way he is presenting i think he is using what is known as dialogic style of presenting dialogic style of teaching if you like and the last point to remember bite size small 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 do not spend one whole hour teaching or explaining things, but break it up into small size, bite-size chunks that the students can digest, that the students can learn from you. So that's point number two, yeah? Point number three. I hope you remember the first one is technology and the teacher. Number two is technology and their teaching methodology. Number three is technology and the text. Remember, technology now or the internet now is a wonderful, amazing, amazing source of teaching materials. Text here stands for teaching materials. Teaching materials can be texts from websites and from other sources on the internet. Teaching materials or text here can be video materials or podcast materials or any other kind of materials. Even posters can be uh, seen as, as an example of text teaching materials that you're using. Yeah. The most important thing, Baba Ibu, to remember is this. I think you know this. And you will agree with this. That the text that you use, the teaching materials that you use, will have to be very, very interesting. Not so much for you, but for your students. And that requires a lot of skill, a lot of experience from the teachers to choose just the right kind of teaching materials. Yeah, because that is the starting point for learning to happen. If the text is not interesting, the students will likely to switch off. Switch off means they will not be paying attention. And when that happens, they will not be learning uh, very much from you. I think we are reminded of the importance of teaching materials that are, number one, very, very interesting. It's so compelling that the students want to find out more about it. The students get very excited. The students are willing to spend half an hour, maybe one hour in class, and maybe another hour outside the classroom. So that is because the materials are interesting. Yeah, it, 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 you know, it ignites their curiosity. Hey, teacher, the text is so interesting. I want to know more about this. Can you tell me where I can find more information about the uh, topic that we are discussing today? But point number two is comprehensible. If you are a language teacher, you have to make sure that the content is interesting, but also the language is accessible. The language is easy to understand. If the language is difficult to understand, the students will just learn the content a little bit, but they will not be able to learn from the language aspect of the text. I hope that makes sense, yeah? So in other words, the content and the, and the uh, 
and the uh, uh, difficulty level of the text will have to be just right. Not too easy, not too hard, but really, really exciting for the students to learn here. So let me say this again, contents are king. Contents are probably the most important thing that you can start to get your students to be interested and excited about the uh, uh, learning that happens in the classroom. So content, content, content. Where do we get information? Where do we get interesting content, uh, teaching, learning materials? One source is TED. Just a lot of information, a lot of contents that will get your students to be interested in learning. Yeah, here's just some example. If you are teaching ESP students, engineering students, for example, or science students, this might be of interest. Here is another one. Civil engineering students might find this really, really interesting. Business. These are just examples from TED, uh, TED. There's a lot of information there. Here is something about psychology. Another one about psychology as well. Yeah, the point here is that technology, the internet, the digital world is there for you to use to, is there for you to bring into the classroom so that the students get to enjoy much more interesting contents from your lesson. And today, a lot of the uh, materials that are available on the internet are video-based. And here is a website that you might want to look at. And all these videos are freely accessible and freely downloadable as well. Yeah. So increasingly, if, if you've been using text-only materials, I think you should start considering using video materials. And nowadays, all these materials are available uh, for free for educators to use. Yeah. Very important problem for us to resolve. Yes, the contents have to be interesting. The contents are interesting. This is sometimes, this is what often happens. You find something on the internet. The contents are so interesting for you and your students, but the language may be too hard. What can we do? Remember, these two things must come in one package. The contents are interesting, but the language will have to be manageable, accessible. Yeah? So what do you do? David, if you find something interesting on the internet and you want to use it, but you, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, mm, my students may not understand very well. What do you do? Can we use technology to solve this problem? Later, you can ask about, uh, Jati about this. But if you ask me, yes, there are tools that are available, subtitles. Yeah. If the subtitles are still too difficult, use this. Or Google Translate which means that you need to spend a bit more time preparing your students, giving students the text first, maybe simplify the text or even translate the text in the student's language. It doesn't matter before they watch the video. So technology can provide a very simple and very efficient solution to your students, okay? Please remember this. If you are a language teacher, if you're an English language teacher, remember this. Students learn a lot of language when they see and when they hear a lot of interesting and accessible text. The key word here is a lot of reading, a lot of viewing, a lot of listening. Interesting text. Yeah, like these two girls on my slide, yeah. Like the uh, many students in Singapore and elsewhere who spend a lot of time in the classroom, I think they are reading from books, but they can also reading from, 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 you know, from, uh, from their uh, gadgets as well. But the key thing to remember is language learning happens when the students see, when the students hear the language every day for one whole year, for two years, for three years. Okay. Next, I think I, I need another ten minutes, uh, David. So, point number one is 
technology and the teacher, yeah? Point number two is technology and teaching methodology. And point number three is technology and teaching materials, right? The next one is what you do with the materials. What kind of activities, what kind of tasks can you prepare so that the students become very engaged, so that the students get an opportunity to explore, to extend what they have learned from the text so that they learn more. That is the purpose of the task here. The kind of task that you should be thinking about is this, the kind of task that involves some problem solving. There are some problems because problems are interesting. Problems make us think. Problems make us feel perplexed. Problems make your students become curious. They want to find out the solution to the problem, yeah? So if you are able to find problem-solving tasks for your students to work on, I think chances are higher that your students will become more motivated, they be, they'll become more self-determined. They want to learn, not because they have to, but they want to, yeah? Now, the kind of problem-solving tasks that can encourage your students to read more, and to learn more, I think that will be ideal. And the internet is a great source for that. In my teaching these days, I always give the students my, a task and I ask them to explore the information from the internet to find out more about the problem and to find potential solution to the problem. Remember, the task must engage students in further exploration elaboration by giving illustrations examples and so on and so forth and the task should also provide opportunities for the students to self-evaluate have i learned is there anything that i haven't learned can i check with my uh, classmates can i check with my teacher so self-assessment is going on all the time yeah here is an example from my class it's not a language skill class, but it's a, it's a language, uh, it's, a, it's a teaching uh, method class. So the name of the course is Language Teaching Methodology. It's about how to teach basically, yeah? the theory and practice of language teaching. So my students are graduate students. I have 20 teachers in my class around there, 20, 25 teachers, uh, local teachers from Singapore and also international teachers from Vietnam, uh, some of them from India and uh, many of them from China. So I have a mixture of local and international uh, students. Yeah. And let me share with you one lesson that I did. And I share with you how I integrate uh, many of the things that I discussed early on with you about the importance of me speaking less, for example, about the importance of using texts and task that will help the students to explore, extend, and deepen their understanding. The design of my lesson is this. There is a before learning that happened, the during learning that happens in the classroom, and the after learning that happens after the lesson is over. The starting point is this, the learning outcome. Yeah, the learning outcome is this. I told my students that we'll be discussing the theory, the research on how to teach vocabulary. And why vocabulary is important and what research tells us about the uh, place, the role of vocabulary in language learning, right? And the learning outcome or the task that I want them to work together with me is this. At the end of the lesson, the students will put together a set of principles for teaching vocabulary. Yeah, so that's the final job, the task or the problem that the students will have to work with. Before the class, like one week before, I sent them something using a simple application called Wakelet. So this is where the students get information about the teaching of vocabulary. And this is also an opportunity for the students to start thinking, reading, 
comprehending and discussing and interacting using this uh, application called Wakelet. Yeah, Wakelet is very easy to use. Look at it later. And then during the lesson, a short lecture from me. Again, very brief, not more than half an hour. And there's a lot of discussion and debate in the classroom. And then after, after I use a very simple application like Google Document for this uh, Google Doc for the students to interact, to continue working on the topic further. So that is more or less the design of the lesson. So this is the before, so the one week before I sent them information, reading, uh, literature on Wakelet and the students read, tried to understand, and then they tried to respond to some of the questions that I posed in Wakelet. So here are some of the uh, responses. You don't have to read this, it's very small here. Yeah? I'm just giving you an example of the kind of learning that happened before. The before thing is very, very important. This is known also as a flip classroom. The flip classroom is really, really wonderful because students do a lot of learning before they come to class. And during the classroom uh, setting, the students deepen and extend what they have learned before they come to class, yeah? So here are some other examples, yeah. Okay. Remember the before thing is very important. Now, during the lesson, as I said earlier, I give a very small lecture, uh, pointing out, highlighting the key points from research about the teaching of vocabulary. And then I got the students to work in groups and they have to contribute one or two principles for teaching vocabulary in Google Doc. So this is something very simple to use, but at the same time, very useful because it gets the students to think very carefully and to exchange ideas with the other uh, you know, students in the classroom. Do you remember how many students I have early on that I mentioned to you? I have about 20 students, yeah? 20 students, and they have to contribute one or two principles. Each one will have to contribute one or two principles in Google document. So how many principles do I have? At least 20 or maybe 30 principles, right? But those are raw principles, yeah? Not the final principles. And this is the next step. I ask the students to have a debate. They have to present their opinions about which principles must stay and which principles must go. So there's a lot of healthy uh, discussion going on during uh, this part of the uh, lesson. And finally, I have about 10 principles. My job there is a mediator or a facilitator. And after the lesson, I ask students to volunteer <clears throat> like three or four or five students to volunteer to you know put together the final list of principles 10 or 12 and I ask students to edit the text in Google Docs and I ask them to write a small introduction and a small conclusion so the uh, learning outcome is a piece of joint student papers with a small introduction and conclusion and a lot of discussion about the uh, 10 principles for teaching vocabulary. I hope that makes sense to you, yeah? This one. And finally, their product is uploaded on Facebook for the world to see and also in my website, Willis Ear the Corner. It's available there, you can look at it if you want to. Students work, yeah? So there's a lot of learning that happens before, during and after. This is my final bit, but let me just repeat once again what I we have just discussed together. Uh, I hope you remember. The first one is teach the uh, technology and the teacher. Very important. That's the most important bit. Technology and teaching methodology. Yeah, these days you cannot use the lecturing style only. I think mean, that's not the best way to uh, approach to using the classroom. And then technology and the text. The fourth one is the task. And the last one is the test. The word test nowadays is being replaced by the word assessment. 
in particular, the focus today is on assessment for learning. We assess our students more frequently. We assess our students more regularly and our assessment tend to be small. So small, 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 instead of just one big one at the end of the semester. And the purpose, very important. The goal, the purpose of this kind of assessment is to support learning. Not so much to test, but to support student learning. Well, of course, at the end of the day, we need to find out whether or not the students have learned from you. But, but assessment for learning is, uh, is an important part of teaching, actually. Because as you teach, you assess as well, so that the assessment information that you get can feed back to you and help you to improve on or to revise your teaching uh, next time round you see your students. Quizlet is very often used in the classroom. Uh, Kahoot, for example, is an excellent way for you to integrate assessment for learning in the language classroom, yeah? I think you are familiar with Quizlet. Uh, it's a freemium uh, application, the, the, uh, the free version. I think you can use the free version and that's more than enough. But if you have money or if you don't have money, ask Boeka and Boeka will sub subscribe to Quizlet. It's, 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 a, it's a very nice uh, application that you can use, yeah? Uh, Mentimeter, I think is, is very useful for you to assess to find out at the same time to make your lesson more interesting. Yeah, you break it up into, you break up your lesson into bite size, small. And af after each small segment of your lesson, you get the students to tell you to what extent they have learned or to what extent they need to learn more about certain areas that are not very clear. Yeah, so the key thing to remember today is this, that we must think about how we can provide opportunities for our students to demonstrate to you their understanding, their learning using multiple, many, many different ways, not just one single way. Remember the word multi is very important these days because that is the reality of our students. Yeah, some students are good with language verbally. Some students are not very good with language, but they are equally intelligent. They are equally smart. Maybe they can use drawing. Maybe they can use some application from the internet to demonstrate their learning, to demonstrate their understanding. Some students are very good with their body. Yeah, the gestures, dancing, for example, uh, so they can show their understanding using role play or dramatization or things like that. The key thing to remember is assessment for learning means your attention is on your students. Help your students to express their comprehension or demonstrate their understanding or their learning in multiple different ways. This is just an example. If you, if you Google this, you'll be able to find like, wow, 50 different ways of checking, of assessing your students' comprehension. Yeah. And there are many other examples like this. So what I'm saying here is there are hundreds and hundreds of different ways you know, in terms of how you can help your students to demonstrate their understanding using different, different ways. <clears throat> if you are looking for something simple, uh, here is another one. Yeah. You can ask students to present, to demonstrate their understanding virtually using written uh, language through this discussion using technology, for example, podcast, uh, Flipgrid, or any other applications, or kinesthetically using gestures, you know, uh, using movements and things like that. The key thing is there are many, many different ways we can engage our students in uh, learning and also in demonstrating their learning using multiple different ways. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen, Yeah, technology is there to stay with us for many, for many, many uh, years to come. But the key thing is for us to focus more on the pedagogical aspect, on what we have known, of what we have learned, 
from many, many years of teaching. Yeah, if you add technology to that, I think you can just make your lesson more interesting and more useful for your students. But technology itself is not the most important thing where learning is concerned. It's how we use technology uh, that is important, yeah? So technology plus pedagogy, and that is a very happy marriage made in heaven. Slide terakhir, Bapak-Ibu sekalian. This is my final slide. Remember this. The best way to get our students to learn more is to increase the quality of our teaching. The quality of our teaching. And we can do that with the help of technology. Thank you very much, Pak David. Thank you very much, for, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to make my slides available. Uh, we'll send this to you uh, in the chat box very soon.